Welcome, Bent Riders around the world. My name is Gary Solomon, and you're watching the Laid Back Bike Report. Really glad to have you all with us today. We've got a, another really good show coming up for you. So stick around. Let me tell you what we got uh, coming up. Uh, first of all, from uh, the UK, we have Alan Goodman, and he's going to give us the uh, scoop on the World Human Powered Vehicle Championships coming up next month. We got uh, Brian Ball, of course. He's going to talk to us about what's new in the world of recumbent bikes. We have uh, Paul Elkins, the uh, do-it-yourself bent inventor. Uh, he's a great guy to talk to. He knows a lot of stuff about building recumbent bikes and a lot of other things. So uh, that'll be our major guest today. Uh, I'm sure you'll like uh, listening to what he has to say. Peter Stahl, uh, we're working on getting him with us today. I think he'll be here in time to give us a little uh, recumbent bike history lesson, as he usually does. And uh, then we've got a very special sports report today, kind of a combination. Uh, Denny's going to head it off as usual. And then uh, Doug and Larry and, um, and myself are going to work on talking to you a little bit about the Trans Am that's going on right now. Um, a very important uh, bike race across the country that everyone's talking about in the recumbent world. So stick around for that. I think you'll enjoy that as well. And please don't forget to uh, subscribe in that lower right-hand corner. You'll see a little red subscribe button. Click on that, and I'll subscribe you to the uh, Layback Bike Report uh, YouTube channel. And in the upper right-hand corner, little white letter I, which has lots of information. It'll take you to our web page, and you can find out lots more about the Layback Bike Report there. So please uh, click on that when you have a chance uh, as well. We have a live chat going today, as we always do, which allows you to participate in this program. Uh, those of you that are watching us right now will be able to uh, ask questions, share your thoughts with us, uh, and even share thoughts with some of your fellow bent riders that are on the chat. So it's a great community there. We hope you will take advantage of that. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, on the YouTube uh, page, the watch page, you'll find it just to the uh, right of the watch window. Uh, if you're on mobile, probably below. And if you're watching on Bent Rider or Facebook or Twitter, you might want to click through to where it says YouTube on the bottom of the screen there and go to the actual YouTube page uh, where you'll see the chat. All right. I want to talk to you about our sponsors who, uh, who graciously help us every month. First of all, TerraCycle makers of exquisite recumbent parts and accessories for your bent, and trailside.bike, where you'll get free shipping on all orders over $50 until July 1st, 2018, and Velocity, makers of performance wheels and rims, they're handmade in the USA. All right, guys, let's... Uh, Let's introduce our panelists. We have uh, we have a, a full boat uh, today. We're we'll start out uh, with our director from Salzgitter, Germany. Um, he is also our EU representative, and who doesn't need one of those these days? It's Lars Kahn. Hey, Lars. Hey, folks. Good to be here. All right. Let's move along to Raymond, Mississippi, to our media guy. It's Trey Burgoyne. Hey, Trey. Hello, everyone. Good to be here. Hey, Trey. Burgoyne. We're going. Yes, it sounds like a ricochet, doesn't it? Uh, okay, from Rochester, New York, the founder and editor of Bent Rider and the anchor of our laid back news desk, and the, he coined the Burgoyne uh, uh, name, I think, there. It's Brian Ball. Hey, Brian. And the last guy who should be making fun of somebody else's last name. <laughs> Good <laughs> to be here, though. Last name, anyways. Well, we'll get to that later. Okay. Think about it for a minute and ask me again. Okay, we'll do. Sayre, Pennsylvania is where you're going to find our uh, our next panelist. It's the laid back sports desk anchor, Denny Voorhees. Hey, Denny. Hey, how you doing? Yes, yeah, Sarah. That's uh, everybody knows where that is. Okay, well, we yeah, find somebody yeah. who does besides you, and we will put them on the air. <laughs> you let's do that. To, <laughs> let's go on to Dallas, Texas. That's where we're going to find Mr. Wizard himself. It's Doug Davis. Hey, Doug. Hey, Gary. Good to see you here. Great to have you. And uh, let's see, I don't know, I guess uh, Alfred Station isn't quite with us. So we're going to go on to Colorado Springs. Uh, here's a guy who assaulted Pikes Peak on a trike last week. It's Larry Seidman. Hey, Larry. Hello. That's another story. We will talk about that sometime. It's a great accomplishment. 
And uh, a little later on, uh, hopefully we'll have uh, Larry Varney with us in Cold Spring, Kentucky. So uh, we will welcome Larry at that time. All right, uh, let's get the whole show rolling here. We're going to head out uh, to just uh, north of London, I believe, where we find uh, our friend Alan Goodman. Hello, Alan. Hi there. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm in um, Hemel Hempstead, which is about 20 miles north of London. Okay, right. I wasn't sure exactly what you told me it was, but yeah. I mean, it was a little bit north of London. So, folks, Alan is uh, on the organizing committee of the World Human Powered Vehicle Championships, as I mentioned earlier. Those are going to be held in the UK this summer. And uh, very fortunately, uh, we've managed to uh, to kind of get to there and do a little on location uh, uh, shooting a video. We're going to make a video about these uh, races and uh, we're going to look forward to seeing Alan. But uh, in the meantime, we're going to talk a little bit about human-powered racing next month and tell you what the state of that is in the uh, in the world today. But Alan's here today just kind of talk about specifically about this race and what's coming up. So, Alan, go ahead. Take it away. Tell me about the race. Yeah, hopefully most people already know that um, we're hosting it. British Human Power Club are hosting the World Championships this year down at a place called Better Sanger Park, which is near to um, a seaside town called Deal in Kent. It's about as far as south and east as you can go without getting wet, really. It's um, go any further and you're swimming. But it's a, it's a country park. It's built on what was an old colliery, an old coal mine. Um, but it's now a very nice park with a with a very nice cycle track, a uh, nice smooth tarmac, three kilometres of, of on the main circuit, which we can split to run shorter. Who's that? <laughs> we can we can run. Um, Shorter circuits. Uh, Alan, short you didn't know I stuck that picture in. No, no, no. That he's, was he's, a picture of you. Ray. Uh, is that from 2012? No, that's uh, probably is actually. That was at Kerbera, another little racetrack we go to. Yes. Well, look at the intensity on your face. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's, 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 that's pain. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, yeah. So we're we're going down there on the um, 13th, 14th, 15th of July. So we're we're starting on Friday the 13th, which which may turn out to be a, a bad move, but. We're not, we're not superstitious so we're going with friday the 13th um we'll be doing registration down there and then some sprints uh the races are going to run from everything from a 100 meter flying sprint up to a three hour race um the three hour race will be the, the final event on the sunday where everybody will go out together the shorter races will split people into into groups um we've got currently got 110 entries from Pretty much all over Europe, from UK, Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, Belgium, France, Greece. None from the USA yet, so we'd welcome anybody who wants to come and throw down the gauntlet from over there. There's about another week or so. We're closing entries on on the 16th, and we've got a maximum of 120. So there's 10 spaces left, and you've got a week to to enter if you, if you want to. Um, you can go to the website, which is uh, WC2018 bit.bhpc.org.uk and from there you can you can find the registration process and register online okay alan can you uh, so this this race moves around from year to year i the, i think the pictures that we're looking at here were from 2012 which was the last race yeah so tell me uh, it was in germany last year where has it been uh, over the last few years do you know oh it, yeah it gets around yeah all, all over europe um, as, as you say, it was in Mannheim last year in Germany. The pictures you're seeing are from um, Bettersanger, although it was actually called Falmead, then the names changed. But that was 2012. That's the last time we hosted it. Um, it that's, that's the track you can see there. It's a nice smooth surface and it's um, yeah, a good, good place to go and race. And will you expect to find some racers of of, of note uh, coming to race there? I mean, I, I suppose you have everything from uh, casual uh, people on their uh, recumbent bike and to, all the way to very serious racers. Who do you expect to come? We're expecting um, most of the people that are, are serious from um, from Britain and, and, and Europe. Obviously, um, we'll see Steve Slade, who's, who's won the World Championship several times. Daniel Fenn's coming over with his Alpha 7. The... Um, sort of very special version of his of his df um there'll be you know a lot of very fast riders and as you say there'll be there'll be a lot of people there who are just there for the fun just just um just to have a have a ride and socialize because we've got camping on site so there'll be 
some people that's 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 Derek Tweddle in the picture there. He's, he's um yeah, I think he's I think he's coming. I think he'll be Yeah, it looks like he gave himself an IV <laughs> actually, right on the tarmac there. So yeah, yeah, hopefully he'll be okay. Yeah, I think that I think that might have been before the race actually. Oh god. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's, that's a, a heck of a way to start out. Yeah. Okay, but, well, but obviously the other, the other notable there is Mike Burrows. Um, obviously, most people know of Mike from the machines he's built. It's, it's his 75th birthday this year. So one of the things we're doing at the event is, is having a celebration of his birthday, and we're trying to get as many of his machines together as we can. So we're going to have, um, hopefully, representing some of the machines that he's built through, through the years, obviously. Um, the recumbents, the wind cheaters, and the rat racers, and things like that, and also the the, the bike that Chris Boardman, or one of the a similar bike to one Chris Boardman won the Olympics on, which Mike designed. Um, and then on the that there'll be a static display of those over the weekend, and I think on the Saturday night we're going to run a little parade of all the machines. So hopefully in sort of speed order, so we'll put the slowest ones at the front, fastest ones at the back, and hopefully they'll all finish roughly together. But <laughs> that's a great <laughs> way to start them. So yeah, yeah how these things go. Some, somebody will probably shoot off on a freight bike and, and put in a thirty mile an hour lap and, and well, ruin that. Alan, I'm I'm so excited to uh, to come and and see the the races in person. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you in person and yeah, we're uh, see what goes on there. Uh, yeah. We're gonna I, I hope to get some nice interviews of of Mike and some of the other folks uh, of note there and 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 the re and the regular racers as well. Yeah. So. Uh, I look forward to seeing you then uh, next month sometime. And thank you for coming on and uh, and sharing your thoughts about the the race today. Thanks for having us. Good luck with the rest okay. of the show. We'll okay. You there. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Alan. All the best. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks. All right, folks. Uh, let's move along then to uh, Brian. He's got our uh, news report for for this month. Brian, you ready to go? You might be <laughs> muted, Brian. Hey, Brian, nothing. We got like almost nothing. All right. Uh, maybe, uh, why don't you play around with that, Brian? I think we're going to just go ahead. Uh, Paul, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself? And folks, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our, uh, our special guest today. This guest is an inveterate tinkerer. He built his first recumbent uh, bike in high school, shop class, when he was 16 years old. When he was 20, he saw an article about a front wheel drive reverse steer recumbent in Popular Mechanics. He was intrigued by the concept and determined to create one of his own design. He eventually did so, and this bike became his regular commuter. In the years since, he's continued to come up with interesting new ideas, which he posts on his fascinating website. Here he showcases what he calls his minimalist prototypes in transportation, boating, shelters, and more. He has a very successful YouTube channel where he encourages the viewer to learn and build their own do-it-yourself projects. Bet riders, I would like to introduce to you Paul Elkins. Hello, Paul. Hello, Gary. Hello, it's audience. How are you doing? Thank you for coming on to share your ideas with us. Yeah, no um, it's, it's great. And, and you're out there in Washington State. I always tell where everybody is. I didn't say where you were. Yes, I'm about uh, 60 miles north of Seattle on Kamenno Island now. We just moved here about a year ago. Yeah. Okay, sounds great. All right, let's, if we could, uh, Paul, talk uh, about your uh, biking and uh, recumbent biking history. Tell me about your first experiences with, uh, with bikes, other than what I put in the introduction. Maybe your just first experiences with bikes at all. And then fill in maybe some of those details about uh, getting into recumbent bikes, if you would. Sure, no problem. Uh, I was thinking this morning of uh, the first time I ever saw Ray Cummett, and I have to say it was probably 1970 when my dad took me to a uh, car show. And that's where I saw in the corner of this big exhibition of fancy cars, uh, this bike that was completely laid back. The guy was um, pretty much laying on the ground, real long stretched out thing, fell in love with it. Some I'd never seen like that before. So as a kid, I did a lot of drawing and um, I was drawing just goofy stuff that normal kids draw, forts, bombs, you know, those kind of weird things. And I started drawing a lot of recumbent bikes. Um, don't have any pictures here. I was gonna try to download some this morning, but I still got my old stacks of drawing books from way back. Um, they're kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, um, 
uh, speed up to about um, 1973, four, I was 16, had a middle class, and uh, I made a, um, I think the first image there is, um, shows at least a drawing of the first recumbent that I built. Why don't we go ahead and yeah. uh, jump to the slideshow if you're ready, Lars and Trey? Yeah, this was pre um, HPBA actually. Um, so this was kind of my first bike. I just drew it out years ago. Like I said, never got a photo. And I actually took on two positions. One, you could sit on it normally, or you could flip the uh, the uh, ten speed handlebars down to where it would uh, support your back, and you could pedal in a recumbent position. Mm -hmm. I never totally completed this rig, but uh, I at least was able to coast around on it. It was fun. It was fun. Um, so after that, it was quite some time before I built the bike that uh, Gary was talking about there. Um, in between that time, I was, again, doing a lot of doodling and um, really fascinated with the, the recumbent idea. At the time, there was really nothing out there other than occasional article and bicycle magazines. A um, couple old books I got were, um, oh, Bicycle Science. I'm trying to remember what year that came out. And that was pretty cool, chock full of all kinds of stuff. But anyway, um, as time went by, I saw, like I said, this article in Popular Mechanics of a kid who had made a rear wheel steer, a front wheel drive bike. And I thought, well, you know, it's in Popular Mechanics, it's got to work. That would make a shorter chain, make the vehicle lighter. And I obsessed on this thing for like five years. I counted up the drawings that I'd done, at least 100. Until when I was 22, I, I finally put it together, and that's what you're seeing here. It took me two hours to get both feet off of the ground. <laughs> it was like riding a unicycle. I, I definitely uh, was upset that this didn't work as well as it did. Um, but I was determined, ended up um, mastering and being able to ride it back and forth to work. I was the only one who could ride it. I even challenged people 20 bucks if they could ride it within 10 minutes. Nobody beat the challenge. <laughs> So anyway, um, moving on to about 26. Next slide, please. So we, um, I built this rig. Um, it's just basically an extended version of a uh, BMX bike. And um, it worked out pretty good. It wasn't perfectly balanced. You can see a lot of the weight was on the rear wheel. It did have a tendency to slide out a bit when um, going downhill on a sandy turn. Um, but uh, next slide. Let's see. Here is a couple of years later. It went through a couple of renditions until finally I wanted to get in on the uh, uh, kinetic race. I noticed uh, Boulder, Colorado. This is when I was in Colorado. I was putting on a show and um, having their little race. I decided to try to get into it myself. Took the old bike put some pontoons on it. Here I am testing it out in a, a little pond that had just thawed. Um, yeah, 30 seconds after this picture, I was actually in the water. <laughs> hey, Gators. Paul, so, <laughs> uh, um, so this kinetic race, usually the ones I'm familiar with, they like go down, a, it's like a parade, right? They go down the street or something. So yeah. was this done, was it supposed to be something that would go on water? Oh yeah, oh yeah. The, 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 um, the challenge for kinetic racers to be able to go on land, sea, and mud. Okay. And just all kinds of terrain. So, so this might have been the, this might yeah. have been the uh, inspiration for Randy Ridings that I was talking to you about. We're going to talk a little bit, just a, a little bit about Randy, and he's starting the his he built that quad yak, the the amphibious uh, uh, quad uh, out of a kayak and stuff. I'm, and he, I know you were a big inspiration for him. I don't know if you saw this. To start him off or not? Maybe uh, after you told me about Randy, I got onto his uh, Facebook and I'm kind of following him now. It's pretty cool what he's doing. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, this was just kind of uh, it worked pretty good. The pontoons flipped up 180 degrees, but what happened was the the levers that held the pontoons in place here released, flipped up, and all the force came down on the thing, broke the tape that was holding the pontoons of the bike. Luckily, I held my hands out and got, was able to get both pontoons under my arms while my gaiters filled. I would have died. I mean, I was it was a 
It was a crazy situation 30 seconds after this picture, but I made it. I survived. And um, I never did go to the races. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I did end up using this quite a bit. I turned it into a three-speed, found a little front wheel that came off of a orange crate. Remember those? Uh -huh. High-speed orange crates. Had the drum brake. It was very fun. Um, so let's see. Years later. Go ahead and next slide. I'm not sure what I got next. Oh, yeah, while well, I was building that, a neighbor kid saw what I had done, and I, he wanted one, so I put this together for him. Just a little one speed. And next slide. Okay, well, later on, um, I was noticing that there were uh, recumbents out there that were mid-steer, and this was my attempt at kind of a, a minimalist version of a mid-steer. Next slide. Here it is in all of its glory. Um, I couldn't ride it. <laughs> it was totally unrideable. So, you know, there's successes and there's failures. This is one but of But you learn from everything, failures. right? I mean, yes, I you suppose. do. Yes, you do. And you learn not to totally paint the item before trying it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a waste of time. So, anyway, that was that. And that probably could have worked if I had switched around, put the steering on the rear instead of had the steering. Uh, you know, see, kind of my steering and my seat were reversed from what other people are doing. Anyway, so next slide. Let's see what we got next. Um, okay, here we are. A few years later, I was probably about, um, this would have been only about 38, about 22 years ago. Um, I decided to make a nice recumbent, kind of based on a king cycle. This uh, was basically aluminum main beam. Uh, came up to about total 25 pounds. Next slide, please. And here I am on it. I had found some titanium from work. Don't tell anybody. I wasn't supposed to <laughs> sneak it out of the shop. Uh, I yeah, I think the statute of limitations <laughs> probably are uh, up at this right. point. Yeah. But it was a nice bike, and I had it for about a year. I rode around on it a little bit. Unfortunately, um, I got together with the Seattle recumbent community uh, one fine day in the winter and started chatting with somebody. And he asked if I want to come out for uh, a ride with them. And uh, I did. I hadn't been riding my bike for a year. Ended up blowing my knees out on that ride pretty much. And uh, I haven't been the same since. So, yeah, it was like a 36 mile ride. I got about 14 miles into it. My knees started aching. And I had pedaled back with them. Yeah, it was a bad scene. So a lesson um, learned. Huh? Don't well, push it when that happens. Let me, all. if I could, interrupt you for a second. A couple of things here. First, um, our panelist Doug Davis uh, chimed in. You're asking about uh, bicycling science. He said it was published in uh, 1982. Is when it was published. That's correct. Uh, thank you, Doug. And uh, on the uh, live chat, uh, log notching. That's our buddy Ed Miller, uh, Paul. Besides a drill press, what is your favorite fixed shop equipment? Fixed shop equipment, a drill press. Um, I guess, what's your favorite? Uh, yeah, what a grinder? Okay. My grinder's been replaced with a hand 90 degree uh, angle grinder. Those are beautiful. You can cut off saw, grind anything you want. You can put it in a vise, and that turns out to be a stationary tool. It's, it's so not so much fixed, but it's still a, a it can be fixed, and I love that too. I mean, I paid twenty bucks for the Harbor Freight fifteen years ago, and it's still going. Amazing! Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right, let's go on back to the slideshow if we could. And uh, oh, let's next. go back to the to yeah, the sure. uh, familiar uh, one fellow there. It just now dawned on me the one book that really inspired me was called Pedal Power. It's something that someone came out, and it was just all about. Um, this was probably in 75, 76, people coming up with uh, different applications for pedaling, like um, table saw, not, or, um, scroll saws, drills, grinding food. It was just kind of one of the whole gamut. At the very end of it, it had a lot of recumbent bicycle ideas, and that's kind of where I got a lot of my inspiration, too. Anyway, back to, back to the slide. So, yeah, let's go to the next slide. So <clears throat> now 
this is not so much a recumbent, but I have to throw this in. This is part of my history. Um, on the photo before, I was on my second wife, okay? We had gotten a divorce shortly after that. She wasn't very tolerant of me being in shop or wanting to draw all the time. It was kind of, yeah. So anyway, after I divorced her, I moved to another place, and I discovered Burning Man. Burning Man's a little event in Nevada. Happens every year. It's been going for a long time. It's kind of an art festival for a week. And I was excited to go there. So this was the first vehicle that I built to get around in that event. It um, uses, um, what do I use? I use the wheelchair wheels for the front and a 20-inch wheel in the back and a three-and-a-half horsepower motor. Powered it. Next slide, please. Here it is in all of its beauty. It carried three people. Had a great time with it. Um, the weather there is pretty crazy, I just wanted to mention. I got to about 40 mile an hour winds. All of us were hunkered in my friend's camper, wondering what to do. So my friend said, hey, I brought a tarp and some two by fours and some nails. Maybe we can make a sail and you know, make this thing wind powered. So within a half hour, we put together a sail. Three of us were on it. I was standing in the back of the platform, holding up the sail, going about 30 miles an hour down the playa. That was a blast. Fell off, hurt myself. But next year, go ahead and hit the next slide, please. So the next year I added this sail, which I actually opted to for a uh, cover, sun cover. Um, unfortunately, during test trials, before going into the event, I collapsed the two front wheels. That's why you see these little 10-inch Harbor Freight wheels on here. <laughs> Needless to say, it didn't hold up too well in the sand, and I didn't pay much attention to the motor, and it, it went kerplunkle. And you can read the sign. I got halfway out there, and the sun, uh, engine died. I <laughs> turned into a park bench. Uh, next slide, please. So the third year, I put on some, uh, <laughs> some kind of a garden cart wheels. They're just hard rubber that slip on the rim. And a um, day or two into the event, one wheel fell off. That's, that's a bunch of duct tape I've got around there and zip ties. Yeah, that was a good time. So that was that vehicle. And uh, it turned into a piece of garden art after that. Next slide, please. So um, I went for about six years to Burning Man just by myself. By then, I had married my lovely wife here, Mary. And she's a school teacher. The event starts right at school time. And, uh, she wasn't able to come. Um, a few years in, she decided I want to come. I decided, cool, let's make a vehicle that both of us can cruise around the big playa in. So took the cart, this um, cart that I had shown you in the past, tore off these two uh, steering heads. Next slide, please. And uh, here I am fabricating the front end. So I looked on the internet for ideas of what to make, and um, I saw what was called a Moshe pedal car. And it was a French car that came out during World War II, um, and it basically replaced uh, the car in some parts of France when Germany had occupied that area and was taking all the petrol for the war effort. And here we are, and coming along, almost got it going, but uh, next slide. Here I am working on the body. My favorite material is fluted plastic, coroplast, four millimeter. And um, where I can get it in Seattle, I can get it in multiple colors. Cool stuff. And everybody, everybody too knows about this. It's, I've seen it's been in the IHPVA world for quite some time now. Anyway, here it is, little aluminum frame. Go ahead, next slide, please. And here it is uh, put all together. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So here's the trunk. I decided we're going to be carrying a lot of stuff around the playa. I have lunch in the middle of nowhere. So yeah, I have a trunk on it. Next slide. And I was able to gain access to the rear driving chain, all the, in case the uh, chains fell off or I needed to repair a tire. Next slide. So here it is just before I uh, painted the frame itself. Next slide. <clears throat> I 
all the gadgetry is just for fun. It's an art vehicle more than anything. Um, the only thing that works is the speaker in the center, the clock right above the center of the steering wheel, and I think I had an MP3 player there too. Is that an oil pressure gauge? Exactly. <laughs> <Not near>. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Well, you there's never also know. there's also a handle on there. I saw that looks like it's probably useful. Yeah, it was for the passenger to hang mm -hmm. on to and to get out. Actually, this is this is the coolest vehicle. It only weighs a hundred pounds. The whole thing. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, there's no adjustment. That's kind of one reason why. Uh, I just you know had my wife sit in there, place the pedals to fit her, and same with me. Kept it real simple, real light, just box tubing. Um, <clears throat> for the most part, it's one inch by one and a half inch square, a thin wall steel tubing. Little access to the rear. Yeah. I had to have the big steering wheel, and that's what they had back then, too. That's a fun thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a cool, cool rig. We still have it, and I still... Uh, yeah, <laughs> got an award! Yay! Yeah, we've got. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, Ed uh, Miller, who asked about your uh, equipment in the shop there, uh, Paul. And Ed is uh, is the canopy guy. He makes he makes custom canopies for trikes. Uh, oh, yeah. So he's he's mentioning that here. So I'm sure he is loving what you're doing with this. So <laughs> I should get a hold of him now. For it. I still have the rig. I'd love to get a professional canopy made other than what I have. Oh, so I took it to a car show afterward. There's the kids all fawning over it. Yeah. Any way you can climb any sort of hill at all with that? We have a question from Brendan Doyle. Barely. Yeah. <laughs> now, the, the problem with this and the thing that I learned, the advantages of a tandem uh, is um, tandems have the pedalers pedaling at the same time, the same cadence. So if they're off some and you get into a hill situation, it, it's really tough. It's really tough. It's not like an engine. It doesn't quite work that way. So if you have two people hitting that pedal at the same time, you can make it up a steep hill easy enough. But I am thinking of putting an electric motor in here for assist sometime. So we keep it on the flats. Here, we're taking it camping with us. We go every year to uh, the coast, and I take it with me, throw it in the back of the truck. And the campground that we puts around in is nice and flat. Get a lot of thumbs up, about 360 smiles per hour, as I say. <laughs> And I'm able, like I said, to all have all of our stuff in the back trunk. Is that so some lighting there. around the bottom margin? Oh, yeah, there? little solar lights, just kind of, <laughs> yeah, why not? Nice. So people see us and donate us at night. Right. Yeah. You got to have your lumens. Got to have your lumens. Next slide, please. So um, I had this idea on this particular trike of. Uh, doing a cross between a pedal car and uh, have it motorized. I mostly wanted this one motorized, but in order to you know get beyond the DMV rule of having pedal assist, kind of like the modern moped where you, you barely even use the pedals, it's more for the motor, that's kind of what this was. Found a, um, a Triton trike for kids that uh, had an indexing, um, front wheel where it could you could relax while this front wheel is going forward but you know it's like a unicycle wheel uh, here i got the two horsepower briggs and stratton on the back and i use the same drive mechanism as i had created for the uh my first burning man vehicle the trike i showed you there um it works pretty good this one had a centrifugal flat clutch so i just add gas and go it's actually hooked up to all of my six gears in the back cluster so it's a six speed and I can go up to hills pretty easily with this, or I can go as much as 25, 27 miles an hour. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I decided to put a body on it a little later on. Uh, let's see, half inch steel mostly, light, thin wall. Here I am with the coroplast again, putting it together. This was a fun rig. I really enjoyed it. I wish I could have put more angles to the panels because there was a lot of vibration, kind of a drumming, as you'd call it, as the panels going back and forth and not having that arc in it. But it did, uh, it did get along, and I got about 100 miles per gallon. I was able to carry a lot of stuff and amused a lot of people <laughs> along the way. 
had the roll cage, everything in there. The throttle was pretty much uh, just twist grip, shift normally like a normal bike. Behind the seat there, I had a little uh, lever for choking the engine, and up above I had uh, the actual pull cord. I could start this thing from just sitting inside the rig. You can even have a seat belt. Next. But before we move on to the next one, then, uh, Paul, let me, um, Ed also is asking about your motivation to be different. I think maybe what what I guess I would ask is, so obviously the things you build here are very, very uh, different than what we would see <laughs> out riding bikes and quads and all that stuff. Where, yeah. where do you feel like your inspiration for this stuff comes from? Do you just dream, do you wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, I, I just thought of something and, and write it down or... Or you start working on something and it comes to you. How does where does your inspiration come from? Well, I'm of the uh, thought that no idea is an original thought. I'm like everybody else. I go around and I kind of see what's out there, and then I try to change it up a little bit to my liking. Um, some of them are pretty original. I'll have to admit. I don't know where the inspiration comes from, other than just a lot of doodling. And sometimes I'll do a doodle that just kind of sparks sparks it and um, creates you know i just keep playing with it until it becomes what it is I don't okay. know. I and know. it seems fun for you as well so i'm guessing that's why one of the reasons why you keep coming up with all these ideas you start you get an idea and then it seems like oh that'll be fun to see if i can work on that is that fair to say well, let's say this some people do puzzles some people play sudoku and i like to get on the drawing board and challenge myself with um things that haven't been done before and uh try to figure out the puzzle of how to put whatever idea I have in mind together. So that's it for me. Um, yeah, I've I think spent that answers the question tens of thousands well. of hours of doing that. It's yeah. just kind of a mind exercise for me. And yeah. it wasn't until I was 40 that I actually started making a lot of the ideas that I was drawing. I mean, I got drawing books stacked up probably 16 inches high, each page full of some crazy idea. Not, not so it's, one, not one, it's not one at a time. You you come up with all these ideas and and draw them out, and then uh, you think about what you want to work on. Uh, yeah, those, huh? and I'll admit I'm I'm a bit. I think I'm a bit ADD, so my interests vary. It used to be all recumbents, and I got into shelters, and uh, one thing led into another, and I got into boats, and so at this yeah. age, I've gotten into quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few. Are you working interests. on a fly swatter? Because apparently you can use <laughs> yeah, one of those. Right. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's go right. on back to the slideshow and let's talk about that next bike. Yeah, yeah. So it had been many years since I had ridden a, a recumbent, and all, other than pedaling around the quad that you had seen there, the Moshe quad, I was um, wanted to just see if I could make a simple one and see how my knees were doing. It had been about 20 years since I'd really tried to push myself. So this was just taking a um, five-speed, six-speed, 20-inch um, bicycle and uh, adding a few pieces of tubing. Um, basically, too, I've seen uh, what I could do with minimalist material and, excuse me, minimalist cost. The seat is from Walmart, $15 seat from the fishing section for fishing boat um i'd wish the crank was a little uh longer in the crank arms they're not unfortunately for they're for a kid here i just threw a little chunk of uh, one inch square tubing where the seat post was and so yeah, this, this is an okay trike i still i'm not happy with the way the uh, steering turned out the steering geometry is a little off you could see at the top of the forks i cut it try to angle it some and position the pivot point a little i think it's a little behind the uh, tire patch i'm not sure but it's not ideal the best would be to put it at a, a traditional angle height and then probably um, um, do either a lever or a chain or something and have the steering point two feet back if you, if you get what i mean kind of like the avatar 2000 yeah, so that's that. It's still a comfortable ride. Did find out that my knees are still tender after about a two mile ride. Uh -huh. So here, this slide here is um, 
give you a little history on that. I was watching YouTube one day. This is this is kind of covering how I get inspiration. Watching a guy on YouTube coming down on a skateboard. He's sitting down on it, showing himself with his little camera, uh, passing bicyclists on this long, steep bicycle trail. And some of these bicyclists were road bicyclists that were actually pedaling every now and again, and he was still managing to pass them. And I thought, is this aerodynamics? Or is this maybe something else? And I got to thinking, maybe the little skate wheels don't have as much inertia as a bicycle, large bicycle wheel. And the large bicycle wheel acts as a flywheel, but can only go so fast. Whereas when you get down a little bearing, it could just fly. So this is what got me thinking, what would it be like to have a vehicle with real small wheels? So I started playing around. I wanted to do a quad. Um, you'll see this coming up here in a minute. But this was my test vehicle to test this idea out. It was just supposed to be something real simple, but instead um, I just kind of carried out and made this trike. And actually it turned out pretty good. Next slide. Next slide. So I ended up, um, at first I had the steering coming out the steering post. I wasn't able to tighten it down enough because I was having so much torque on it, as some of you probably know from front wheel steering bikes. Um, so I ended up kind of coming up with this configuration. It works. Don't look at the welds, please. Don't look at the welds. <laughs> Next. Next slide, please. Here's all painted up. So anyway, um, although noisy, <laughs> I guess you've got no air in your rear tires. Um, I was going to say, that looks really loud. <laughs> yeah, they are. They are loud. These are, uh, let's see, 8-inch wheels that normally would come off of those little uh, push scooters that you see, adult push scooters. Um, but it did fly. I mean, it wasn't real fast, but I kind of liked it, and I decided to carry on with my original idea about a year later. Next slide. So this was my idea. I wanted to have like a go-kart that you pedal. And uh, next slide. Next slide, please. So I found these wheels. These are nine and a half inch, nine and a quarter inch diameter, uh, 240 millimeter uh, wheels. Again, off of uh, an adult scooter from Exumer, I think is what it's called. Um, pretty rare. I liked them. Bottom. I ended up taking a cassette from a BMX bike and uh, tearing the hub off uh, from the spokes. Cut the hub down. You kind of see on my video if, if you're interested. I have a, a YouTube site out there, and on this I'm showing how I put this together. But these are just some pictures of that vehicle. Next slide. So this is it before I created the seat, and it worked pretty good. I was fairly happy with it. Um, I was trying to do a two-speed with it. I was having problems getting uh, the gear to stay fixed on the uh, first sprocket. <clears throat> it was skipping a lot. The tiny sprocket on the jack shaft is only like 13 teeth, so I ended up just turning into a one-speed in the end. Next uh, slide. Here we go. This is it finished. So yeah, I had a lot of fun with this guy. It's it's quick going down hills, not very good going up hills. It only weighs 32 pounds. Um, does real good in turns, and that's kind of what I wanted. Uh, I did learn that this, I was really getting excited thinking this would be kind of a cool item to maybe market. But after slamming on the brakes a few times and doing a few slides, I realized <clears throat> This doesn't work too well because all of a sudden your ride's real bumpy. Fum, 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 fum. You get a flat spot in your <laughs> wheel. Not too many people have the ability to put a wheel on a sander and true up the wheel. So anyway, it, it was a fun ride, and it's a fun idea. Maybe if they developed some uh, small pneumatic wheels, this would be uh, a fun rig to ride around in. It might be a good point here. You mentioned uh, your YouTube channel. So Paul has a... Um... A fantastic YouTube channel where he, um, the way he really 
the way he really uh, shows off some of these creations is is by shooting videos. He does a great job of that as well. So you want to check that out. As uh, we do with everything, I'm going to put the link to Paul's, of course, Paul's YouTube channel in the description uh, below the video here. So you'll be able to check that out. Please do check it out. Uh, check out this uh, this little quad that he has. They're they're really fun to watch, even if you're not into building. Uh, the process is interesting. What he comes up with is really interesting, and uh, he does a great job with those videos. So, all right, let's uh, let's see if we can finish up here, uh, Paul. Maybe a few more sure. slides. Uh, something. So, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, just before we started the show this morning, I thought I'm um, thinking of the demographic and things that we didn't include to the slideshow. So we added these few, and this was kind of going back to um, when my knees were still good and when I was still interested in the IHPV race and. It was my dream one day to get into the races. I never did, but here are a few shots of some ideas that I had. Um, yeah, next slide, please. It's very cool. Yeah, next little slide. streamliners. Yeah, I little think streamliner. that's, that's it. That's it. Yeah, I think okay. that's all we got in there at that's the last it. minute. Uh, yeah. Paul, so. so there you go. Um, so that's me. That's that's what I've done, and. Uh, I still enjoy playing around with bikes and trikes and anyway it's a fun thing to do absolutely that was great uh, uh paul tell us what you uh what do you think's coming up next for you what do you uh what do you got uh, working that you can share right now might uh, that we might be looking for um i wouldn't mind making a quad that's covered very similar to uh the pedal car that i had but smaller Tended for one person, smaller wheels. Actually, a fellow came out with one not too long ago. I think most anybody who's on YouTube has seen it. He's got four 16-inch wheels, very nice body. It's blue and black. His is also powered, assisted with electricity. Um, I was hoping to want to just have something kind of like that, maybe using Coroplast. Simple shell. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't got too many more ideas on the drawing board, bike-wise. I'm fluctuating between bicycle uh, boat ideas and shelter ideas, but not so much uh, bike ideas these days, to be honest. <laughs> okay, well, that's fair enough. Yeah. You've, you've got a legacy already, I think, yeah. that we've had a chance to. I've got a question from, on the uh, live chat from Brendan Doyle. Uh, Paul, do you think a no welding challenge and make a bike trike? I think maybe he means, would you consider a no welding challenge and make a bike trike without welding? Is that maybe what he's asking? That would be cool. Uh, wonder what kind of material he's thinking about and what type of joinery. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, if I, you, love the, I love the yeah, bamboo Brendan, bikes. If you want to clarify that, we'll ask Paul in a little bit. I love um, the bamboo bikes and graphite. Yeah, he's, he says what fiber. I, yeah, he's talking That's about. cool. What about the material? Oh, wood. He says wood. Wood is cool, but, you know, I'm seeing um, the bamboos are probably being the more – I don't want to say superior, but in lightness and strength, I'm thinking bamboo and the carbon fiber uh, strands for the joints seem to be yeah. what's really uh, exciting. Yeah, wooden uh, screws is what he was uh, talking about for the wooden build. Wooden screws. So, well, yeah. you can. I mean, you can. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not going to be the lightest. It's not going to be the toughest. I like wood, though. I do like wood. All right. Here's... Uh... Well, uh, Peter Davies asks about your shelters. We're, I, I don't think we're going to get into that because that's really not what we're about. But yeah. they're fantastic. What what Paul does with his small shelters uh, has some great ideas uh, for uh, homeless shelters and stuff. Really cool stuff. Please uh, go to his website, go to his uh, YouTube channel, and check those out. They are worth looking at. Let's stick with the bike stuff, though, if we can. Uh, Ed wants to know, where have you exhibited and uh, and which of those did you feel was like the most rewarding? Where do you show your stuff off other than the laid back bike report? Um, this year was the first year that I exhibited at, uh, well, let's see, a few years ago, I took my uh, Moshe pedal car, the winter Burning Man, mm -hmm. to uh, the Seattle bike show. And um, this last year, I took also the small last quad that you saw, uh, pedal go-kart to the this year's 2018 Seattle Bike Show. That was cool. Got a lot of uh, interest in that. They had a little track to run around on for people to test out bikes. And that got a lot of use with the, the track. And I 
I took the front wheel drive trike and the quad on that and the yeah. bicycle camper, but that's another story. <laughs> I would love, you know, when we go to uh, CycleCon every year, I always have, I bring somebody, Ed uh, Miller was who we had last year, somebody who builds, so does have some unique uh, kinds of things to show off. We bring them into our booth. Uh, for people who are there to show off. And uh, yeah, I would love to have, that's a long way. It's in Tennessee this year. I think we talked a little bit about that, but love to have you sometime and uh, bring a few of your uh, creations there. So we'll we'll talk about that uh, okay. another time. And uh, let's see, I maybe one more. Uh, Vasco Zuzus, do you have any plans for another bike boat? Interesting you mentioned that. A uh, friend of mine and I went to these the uh, Port Townsend Kinetic Race, first time I'd ever been to it. Port Townsend is pretty near where I live. And they have a big event there. We got interested in it. We're wanting to, uh, we wanted to put one together ourselves. And in the end, we just said, eh. but it would be nice, he thought, to make a, a vehicle that he could get from his house to his boat, which is moored out in the water a couple blocks away. So when you had mentioned uh, Randy Ryder, it's like, bing. So I'm, showing my friend that particular uh, amphibious quad and mm, maybe maybe it's a yeah. kind of a cool idea he's got going there yeah, yeah we're going to talk a little bit about randy here uh, at the end of the show so all right super uh paul it's uh finishing up now i guess uh any questions from the panel before we uh let paul go here you guys all okay we're good. All right. So let's uh, go ahead and finish it up. Uh, Paul, any uh, final thoughts or things we might have overlooked that you wanted to uh, mention? Um, not really. One thing that I like these days is the semi recumbents for me anyway. Um, person's getting older, uh, still likes to get out of the seat to get off up a hill. I think you can still do that with some of the semi recumbents, yet still uh, be in a nice, comfortable sitting position that's what i think uh it's kind of the bike of the future recumbents i like but gosh when it comes to those hills there's a lot of them around where i live it's tough it's really tough okay so, yeah so that's kind of my th final thought um yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> that's it. You got your final final again. thought that's the, finally that's the final thought <laughs> Paul, thank you so much uh, for uh, taking the time out to uh, share your ideas with us. Uh, fascinating stuff that you do, and we'll keep our eye on you. Uh, and, uh, yeah, feel free to stick around for the rest of the show if you like. Uh, we got more coming up here, and uh, we're going to get back to Brian here in a second. So, Paul, uh, thank you so much for being Thanks on for the show. Thanks for having me, Gary. I appreciate okay. being on. All sure. right. Our pleasure. All right. Let's get back to Brian. Uh, I think uh, he might be ready to go now. Brian, you there? Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> we're not hearing you, Brian. I know you were there because we heard you ask the question before. Uh, all right. Um, let's, uh, <laughs> I guess maybe we're going to have to bump uh, you a little later, see if we can get that worked up. I don't know what's happening. Um, let's go on to Peter. Peter, do you think you might be ready to go? You unmute yourself. Yeah, hit that unmute button. Bingo. Ah, there we go, Peter. All right, folks, Peter Stahl, the bicycle man. Here he is. What do you got today for us, Peter? Well, we're going to talk about ice now and then. And it's it's not a weather report. I'm talking about uh, ice recumbent trikes. I've got behind me here. There they are. That is a 1992 and a 2018 we're going to look at. So a little history of ice. Uh, Crystal Engineering started in 1986, and they produced the Trice. Uh, they de developed the Trice. Trice was a trike that was very custom made. The frame was custom made. Thank you for the slideshow. That's a 92 there. Why don't you hang on that slide for quite a while? Uh, they developed the Trice, and they were uh, they were very custom made. The seat was made to fit not this one, but a little later versions. The seat was made to fit the rider, and the frame was made to fit the rider, and they're very custom. So you'd submit a bunch of dimensions and they would build this trike for you. And they were absolutely drop dead gorgeous around uh, the late 90s, mid to late 90s. They were just gorgeous. Wouldn't have one in the collection yet, but I'm always looking. And uh, they were expensive. You know, they were expensive because they were all handmade. So then uh, 
Uh, Neil Selwood was a CNC engineer, worked up in Northern England and got tired of the big industrial kind of lifestyle thing. And they moved to the South into Cornwall, which is, uh, as they describe it to me, it's the Florida of England, which means you see the sun sometimes. A little warmer, it's on the ocean, nice place. So he moved down there just kind of to get away from the rat race, I guess. And he happened to run into Peter Ross from Crystal Engineering that was building the trice. And that led to him meeting Chris Parker, who was one of the founders of, of ICE, Trice. And they got together and they bought out the company, I guess. They, they quote, hatched a plan to take over Trice and form ICE. So the, the neat thing I think they did there, well, first, I think Neil brought some really heavy lifting uh, engineering ability because uh, their, their stuff is very nicely done. It was beautifully done before, but now it's engineered and uh, the production has been simplified. And so one thing they did, they, they looked at all the frames they'd ever built. They had a database of all the frames they'd built. They looked at all the heights and widths and lengths and everything. And they decided that basically it came down to four bikes. Uh, and they stopped making custom bikes. They ended the name. Well, the, they didn't right away. They, they still called them Trice, but they came out with the Ice T and the Ice Q. The T was a fairly high touring bike, which has now been replaced by the Ice Adventure. And the Q was a lower, sportier bike, which is based basically on the one in the picture here. And that's been replaced by the, uh, the Sprint. They came in two widths, NT for narrow track and then the standard and uh that's where they were well then they so when they went to this uh production bike they stopped custom making things of course they're they were able to buy frames in quantity and their costs came right down and they lowered their retail prices and i, I think right about then sales went through the roof for them they've been growing ever since i think and uh so the first trice that was trice began exporting to the u.s in 92. the one in the background is a 92. Um, I was talking to Chris, uh, emailing Chris about, I sent him a picture of this and I said, you know, the, it, it's been added to our collection and the, the seat mount is broken, but it's been welded back together and, and painted. And Neil said, yeah, they all broke back then. That was just the way they were. But, uh, you know, when you, as uh, the, the previous, uh, previous contestant said, you learn from your mistakes. And uh, Trice, ICE has done a great job of uh, customer support and warranty support. They have very few problems, uh, but they take care of them. They're not, a, they, they, I've got stories. They are excellent as far as customer support. So uh, since that, what I've talked about, they've added, uh, they could keep refining things, changing this, changing that, little things. They've added rear suspension. They added folding frames, and then they added front suspension in that order. And you know, it's pretty complicated. The front suspension in particular is a complicated project. Uh, for a while, they made a two wheel recumbent. They made two of them. And I think, uh, I'm not aware of a trike maker that got into two wheel bikes that thought they sold enough volume to bother with. So they, uh, Ice and Cat Trike both tried for a while and then dropped them because they weren't selling as much as the trikes. I think that's the lesson there. So I'm gonna, now I'm gonna talk about the two bikes, the 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 one I'm actually showing here today is a 93. It's almost identical to the 92 in that picture. Let's go to the next slide. If that's the 93, yeah. See, there's the difference is this one has a rack on it. There's a few other little differences. It has a a speedometer mount. Okay, there's a note here that ICE is going to be at the World Championships, and that's going to be very interesting in England. We're going to talk about that next month. That's going to be very interesting. That's going to be very interesting to see. They're, they're a sharp bunch. They're a real sharp bunch. So the uh, 93 behind me here, uh, the one that's in the picture, I weighed that at 39 pounds. I took a pound off for the rack. So um, it weighs about 39 pounds. And the 2018 Ice Sprint 26, which is a relatively similar bike, weighs a pound more. But if you, uh, I've never seen a seat mount break on a new ice. So uh, they put a little weight into that, I'm sure. Also, if you, if you grab the top of the rear wheel and shake it side to side, the new bike is about half as flexible as the old. So, you know, they've beefed things up. They've learned from some mistakes and it rides much better. I rode the old one around and the, the steering on the new one is just dramatically better. 
The wheelbase in the old one is 41 inches. That's going to save them a little bit of weight. The new one is about 44. The track width is 31 and a quarter about on the old one. The new one is about 29 and a quarter. So it's a couple, the new one's a couple inches narrower. And the seat height is about an inch lower on the old one. So they're, you know, they're pretty similar bikes. You can see things have changed a bit, but it's not, it's not a gargantuan change. Let me turn my camera around here so I can show you, so I can see what I'm showing you. All right. Now, let's start with the old one. Wait a minute. <laughs> Unplug the power cord. Come on, battery. Do it. Yeah, good. Okay, here's the old bike. Not very well focused, is it? So uh, a couple of things that are interesting. We come around and look at the front of the bike here, the kingpin. Let's see if I can point at this and not drop the computer. Actually, why don't I just take the take the camera off the computer? You know, one day I'll get good at this part, but uh, it hasn't happened yet. Just so really. yeah, find your spot and just hold it real steady, Peter, and then yeah, we'll see it okay. just fine. So this good. is the, this is the kingpin. You see, in the old one, it's just there are two tubes joined at a ninety degree angle, and it's real simple. It's easy to set up a jig. On the new one. Of course, they've done they've done this nice bend and it's all beautiful and everything. But it puts the the height of the seat and the height of the kingpin are about the same. It's just kind of two ways to do the same thing. So uh, that's one thing that they you know you start out simple and work your way up. Another thing about this that's interesting, you see here we have two uh, tie rod ends, and they bolt into here. They hold the kingpin, and uh, you could thread these in and out to adjust the angle some. I don't know if they ever recommended that. This one is both threaded all the way in, but it would be adjustable. And I think that's kind of interesting because, uh, oh, in about 2005 or 2010, around in there, Brian might want to chip in on that. There was an American-made carbon fiber bike that used the same the same kingpin design. And... Uh, I thought it was a new idea in 2005 or 2010, whenever that was, but nope, that was an old idea. ICE had done it in uh, 92. Another thing, you'll notice the kingpin angle here is vertical, and uh, on the, the newer one, you see the kingpin angle is angled out to the side quite a bit, and that reduces the brake steer. It's, a, it's something that older trikes did and newer trikes don't. Well, you put on one bike, one brake, the bike pulls to one side. Uh, we now know how to prevent that. So uh, this is quite a massive seat you see on this. It's uh, it's kind of cupped around your shoulder so that you don't uh, you don't slide out in the corners. And it is wide enough you can corner it pretty hard. The headrest is attached to the seat. It's not adjustable. I haven't ridden it far enough to know if it's real comfortable or not. It has Peter, little, the, yeah. ice is all, I believe ICE has always made their their own seats in-house. I know they do now. Is that the case? Was that was that made from uh, in-house, do you know, the, or the original? I, I think the original was made in-house, and now they have their seats made by a subcontractor. Oh, okay. I'm, I guess I'm I quite sure that. of that. Maybe I, it's the uh, the hard shell seats they make in house. Is that maybe? Yeah, that, that could be. That very well may very okay. well be. Yeah, and they're using carbon, I think, on the on the hard shells now. This one is fiberglass. Yeah, the hard shell seat would be lighter, and that's one thing I ought to say about this. This is a hard shell seat, the lighter bike from uh, 92, 93, and the new one is a mesh seat. Mesh seats are typically a little heavier. So if you were to just switch out the carbon, the modern carbon seat onto this new ice, the price would go up and the weight would go down and it would be faster. And it is available and it is very compatible. You can just bolt it on. It's not a, not a difficult procedure to, to swap seats on an ice. They've, they're very modular. The, uh, the frame comes apart into four pieces and you can, take, you can buy a bike that doesn't have rear suspension and later on add rear suspension to it, which is a neat feature. Most companies don't offer that. Um, it also makes it easy if you really want to take it for an, on an airline trip, you can disassemble the frame and, and, uh, now it's, it's a project to get it all the way apart. It's not going to be something you do in 10 or 15 minutes, but you see the rear frame, it folds here. Can you see what I'm looking at? Let me see here. Okay. Here's the folding joint. 
but it also disassembles here. So if you want to take it apart, you can cut it right down to here and take it apart and put it in a bunch of a bunch of little boxes or one big box or whatever. But it's it's a project to do that. But that means that the the main frame of the bike here is the same whether you have a 20 inch rear wheel or a suspension or not a suspension or a 26 inch wheel or whatever you do back there. The the front cruciform is the same. They basically have two cruciform. Well, three. Well, okay, they have more than that. They they have the adventure which is high, they have the Adventure HD, which is high and wide, they have the Sprint, which is low, and then they have the full fat, and now they've come out with the carbon bike, which is not in production yet. So, but it's, and the carbon bike is interesting because the carbon bike really goes, as they've introduced it, they say it will be custom built to fit every individual. And uh, that's back to where they were with Trice. It was, everything was custom built and uh, really beautiful. So. I think kind of that's where they're going with that. It makes it uh, makes it a lovely machine, but I'm sure the price will go through the roof again because it's all custom and it's it's all carbon. So I just thought these two bikes were interesting that they were so similar. Uh, they're almost 25 years apart, but really the concept is very similar. The steering geometry is much better in the new one. It handles much better. Uh, I'd certainly much rather ride the new one, but you know when you get down to it. They're really pretty similar bikes, and that's that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Now, let's go I'm, through the rest of the slideshow. Do you have a question there, Gary? No, no. I was just okay. going to say thanks for that comparison. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, let's do the slideshow. If you would. Uh, Lars, go ahead and hit the slides. There we go. Okay, so this is the uh, 93. Next slide. This is the two of them next to each other. Uh, you see they have reflective tires now. Also, the old one, uh, the new one is uh, 406 tires, which are easy to get, and the old one is 451s, which it's hard to get a wider tire. Um, and the old one is a 700C rear. Actually, it might be a 27 inch. I didn't check. The new one is a 26. So the tires are, there's a wider variety of beefy tires available for the newer trike. And the new one, you could have disc or drum. Uh, this one has drums, I'm showing, but the, the old one, I believe, was only drum. I'm, I don't believe they had a disc option back then. This is them from the side, and, you know, they're really pretty similar, aren't they? They're pretty similar bikes. Next slide. There they are from the front. If you add a headrest to the new one, it looks a little more like the old one. The uh, The finish and the beauty of the design of the old one, of the new one is much better. Now this is an intermediate bike that's uh, between the two we've talked about. This is their, I believe it's their first rear suspension. That's a, a QNT rear suspension bike we happen to have in the shop used at the moment. And look at how complicated that rack is. Isn't that, uh, you know, someone from HP Velotechnic told me one time they spend more time uh, structural engineering the luggage rack than they do the frame. And you can see on this rack, it's it's not a, simple thing to put a luggage rack on a bike with rear suspension and of course all the hp velos have rear suspension next slide and here's the back end of that bike again you see the suspension pivot is is much simpler um and the rack is complicated now the next slide we're going to go to their modern rear suspension and you see they've really beefed up the suspension with multiple tubes there's four tubes here where the other had two tubes and uh if if you look at ice trikes over uh you know a decade trikes that are basically identical and the parts are interchangeable oh look they've changed this weld a little bit though that gusset got a little bigger because they're learning from from uh, users experience we have a customer that has uh she bought an uh an ice adventure with rear suspension so it, the rear suspension is quite a bit like this and she's ridden, I believe, 30,000 miles on, uh, I think she's on five continents now. She spent the winter in, uh, in uh, Africa. She's not going to, she hasn't been to South America and she's not going to Antarctica, she says. Well, she has 30,000 miles on it. Uh, she was crossing France about a year ago and she broke the rear suspension, uh, the rear suspension attachment. And she sent me a picture of it and sent one to ICE. But, you know, it was Saturday evening. ICE was closed. So I emailed her back and said, you know, ICE is going to take care of this. They're in England. They're going to send you the part. If you need me to be involved, I will. But I don't think, I think Monday morning you get an answer from them. Monday morning they said, uh, 
yes, we'll send you the part. Where do you, where are you now? Which direction are you going? Would you like us to send it to you? Send it to a bike shop near you or to the nearest ice dealer. And she told them her direction and location. And they said, great, there's a good ice dealer about uh, 30 kilometers or 40 kilometers ahead of you. And she went there. By the time she got there, the part was there. It was installed for free and she was on her way again. And it was improved part, no charge. Ice is great about taking care of customers. They're, they're one of the best, absolutely. This is the, the new bike with, uh, with the rear suspension. This, notice the luggage rack has changed quite a bit. And now it's changed again. The new rack, if you buy a new ice with rear suspension, it doesn't, it doesn't use this rack. It's a little different rack. Uh, uh, the lady with 30,000 miles had one of these, has one of these racks, and she broke it, and we repaired it and made it a little heavier, and she says she'll never replace it. She loves it. The new rack attaches to the seat, and when you take the seat off the bike, then you have to disassemble the rack. And if I have to put it in a taxi, she says that's really inconvenient, but it's, it's a much more stout rack, I think. But she's got 30,000 miles, so... With a little a little redesign we did, it's it's you know it's working. So anyway, I guess that's about all I got for today, and it's always fun. Always great to have you, Peter, and uh, nice comparison there. That's really interesting to see uh, the evolution of uh, of the ice trike. I ride one myself, and uh, nice to take a look back and see what uh, what they started with and how it ended up uh, being what they have today. So thank you, Peter Stahl. Very good. I'll see you all later. Right. Folks, uh, I think at this point we're going to go ahead. Brian? Hello? Yes, Brian. Yeah, hey, how's it All going? All right, hit him. There we go. Let's not take any more time. Please go ahead with that news. All report. right, go ahead with the slides. I'm not sure what order you're going to show them in. I will go as the visual cues tell me to. I'm not seeing slides. Now I'm not hearing anything. I see Trey's face. I see Gary muting and unmuting. My internet's not having this. Thing. All right, let me let me jump in here. I, I don't want to. Oh, there we go. Okay. I got it. Can you, you hear me? Yeah, yep. the cruise bike crew, right? Go ahead. Yeah, the cruise bike crew. They just did a really cool ride along the entire Blue Ridge Parkway to raise money for 3,000 miles to a cure. Great cause to cure brain cancer, they do. Uh, as you can see, some people chose to ride old fashioned bikes, but uh, whatever. Yeah, but I, I've ridden that ride before. It is difficult. It is very hilly. They're, they have a great post on their blog that really like details the whole adventure. I read the entire thing. It looks like a great time. Wish I could have gone. You can go on to the next one. We have, oh yeah, Hostel Shop's having half price shipping on recumbent trikes and bikes. Uh, that may not sound like a huge bargain, but if you're buying like a fully assembled electric assist trike, like the one here in the picture, half price shipping might save you a couple hundred bucks. It's actually a really good deal. So go check them out. It's a limited time thing, but go check that out. And next up, we have a new trike from Performer is the last thing we have here. New carbon fiber trike. Let me pull up my note here to make sure I'm not screwing anything up on this. Uh, yeah, it's called the Cantus. 27.1 pounds. Beautiful looking carbon fiber frame. It does have all new steering and kingpin geometry compared to their other models. And uh, it's just gorgeous. And a nice thing I think about this, if you are a Shimano fan and you're into recumbents, pretty hard to find stuff with Shimano stuff on it. They're specking this all Shimano. Comes in either 105 or Altegra. Uh, with the glass fiber seats, it starts at $36.99, $42.99 for the Altegra. You can get one of Performer's really cool five-spoke composite rear wheels or a carbon Kevlar seat, all that stuff. Through RBR now, they have a great US distributor. So if something breaks, you're not going to be dealing with China. You'll be dealing with Rob at RBR, which is a great thing. Really cool trike. Really can't get wait my can't wait to get my hands on one of these. Twenty seven point one pounds. He's only about three hours away. I think that's worth the drive to go down there and check that out. So uh, I'll be checking that out hopefully sometime later this summer when he gets them in stock. Nothing close and in that, that price range like that, is there, Brian? No, I mean, yeah, you're looking at you're looking at about yeah, a little less than Cat Drake 700 money, and it's carbon fiber. So right, that's what I meant, carbon fiber. So yeah, um, it's a uh, it is direct steering, but um, I never found the previous uh, performers, the more modern ones, the newer ones, to handle poorly at all. And this is an improved version of that. So I'm very eager to get my hands. But just look at the rear triangle on that thing. That is gorgeous. 
I think you have a couple more shots, don't you? Have a couple more shots. Yeah, a couple more shots of it. Yeah, if uh, Trey wants to hit the next one. Yeah, there we go. There you go. Look at that. This is actually on the bike, but it's the exact same rear triangle. I was just trying to find a a pretty close up of it, but it's really pretty. And then there's one I think also of the yeah of the boom there. It looks like really well done carbon also. So and and I love this bolt on uh, derailleur adjustment. So you see that just kind of bolts on for the front derailleur. You take it off if you don't want a front derailleur, and you can move the derailleur up and down. I'm pointing at my screen like you guys can see me pointing at it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, it's it's cool. So if you want to run really big chain rings or really small, you can move the derailleur up and down super easy, just like you could on a post. But this is removable, which I think is pretty awesome. Okay. I think that's about it. That should do it then. All right. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> I'm glad we third, finally... third time's a charm. Yeah, I'm, fl I'm glad we finally got to you and got the, that report from you. So we appreciate it, Brian. All right, folks, I think we're going to go to this extended uh, sports report. Denny's going to head it off here and tell us uh, tell us what's going on in the world of sports. Denny, go ahead and take it, would you? Yeah, I sure will. This month there will be reports from Doug Davis about the Trans Am that's going on right now, and Larry Zeidman will be uh, Zeidman. I'm sorry, will be. We'll report on the Warrior Games. First up, though, I want to give out a shout to the only recumbent in this year's race across America. Sergei Zimin is the venerable 73-year-old Russian who will be making his seventh attempt to ride his home-built and designed recumbent bike from Oceanside, California to Annapolis, Maryland. The race for solo starts this coming Tuesday, and Sergei has 12 days and 20 hours to complete the race. I hope... Uh, to be able to report that he finally makes it this year. Sergey's had uh, uh, six, uh, did not finish this, but uh, he's out there, he's having fun, and uh, good luck to you, Sergey. I, I hope it goes well for you. Uh, so now Larry has a report on the Warrior Games. Hi. I hope you can hear me. Uh, the Warrior Games were established by the Department of Defense as a way to enhance the recovery and rehabilitation of wounded, ill, and injured service members and expose them to adaptive sports. Participants include active duty service members and a small number of veterans with various physical and mental injuries and impairments. Cycling is just one of 11 sports, and these athletes represent the United States Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Special Operations Command, UK Armed Forces, Australian Defor Defense Force, and Canadian Armed Forces. Actually, go back a slide or two. Uh, so I was a uh, course marshal out on the course, but before the race started, I was, go back one more. Yeah, there we go. Uh, here's a picture from the what they call the team area where they just kind of set up and get things organized. Uh, some are hand cycles and some are recumbent trikes, different classifications based upon everybody's uh, physical and mental impairments. Most of the recumbent trikes were Cat Trike 700s and I did see a few ICE VTXs. Next slide. And so here you can see one's a Cat Trike 700 coming down and the other was a ICE VTX. Next slide. And uh, they had a bunch of classifications for various hand cycles. Uh, so one was kneeling, and the middle one, you could see the guy's not very aerodynamic, and then the third one was even more reclined and aerodynamic. Next slide. Another volunteer there was Mark Power. You can see him on the left. Some of you might know him. He was there helping with setting up some of the cycles and whatever mechanical issues they had. Next slide. And so rather than going through all the various results, just because there's so many classifications, there's what all the classifications break that broke down are. Some are uh, the road races and some are the time trials. And you can go to that website. I don't know if you can see it, dodwarriorgames.com, uh, if you really want to look at some of the more specifics on different uh, names and how they did. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna head. And we'll post that, of course, uh, down there in the description of uh, Larry. Okay, so that's all I got. Thanks okay, thank you, thank you, Larry, and um, and now I just want to do a little intro here, and then we're gonna get back to uh, Doug, and I, I think uh, Denny will maybe chime in a little bit, maybe even Larry, uh, about the Trans Am. So so much talk online about this uh, about this incredible race that's going on. Uh, 
Then he mentioned Ram, which we've followed for the last few years. Uh, this is a race across America also, but it is quite a different race. And I'm going to let Doug tell you a little bit more about it. But uh, there are a couple of recumbent riders in there. They are uh, they are Velomobiles, and it's just great to see how they're doing. So, Doug, let's uh, start off uh, talking about uh, the, the Trans Am uh, race uh, this year. Sure, Gary. This is the this is actually the fifth uh, Trans Am, and uh, the tra there's actually this race has been going on for 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 a number of years. But um, about five years ago, uh, it was uh, kind of coalesced into a, uh, a an actual organized event. Uh, it started on June the second of this year. This is really an beyond ultra marathon race. Uh, the, the the riders travel across the United States, completely self-supported. Uh, not like, unlike the Ram where you typically have a crew, you have, you know, people pushing you along, you have people handing you water. Uh, the, the Trans Am doesn't have any of that. That it is you, your bike, and anything you can find along the way. Uh, the, the, trans, the, the Trans Am uses the, the tra what's called the Trans America Bicycle Trail that was developed by the Adventure Cycling Association for the Bike Centennial event in 1976, to give you an idea on how long this has been going on. Um, the, uh, the, uh, there's even a, there's a movie about this race. Uh, the very first, the, the inaugural official Trans Am race uh, had a movie crew following it, following it, and the movie's called Inspired to Ride. So uh, if, even if you're not a fan of, 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 of bike, watching bike racing on TV or watching movies about bike racing, uh, or like me, a fan of watching sports on TV in general, uh, <laughs> the movie is well worth the time to watch it. The filmmakers did a great job of capturing the elements of the race, not by spending time on the race, but spending time on the people and the drama of how the race unfolds. Uh, there's been a few changes in the route uh, over the years. This year's race started in Astoria. It ends in Yorktown. It crosses 10 states, about uh, a little under 4,200 miles, and the, the, about 31 miles of vertical gain across the entire race, just to give you an idea on how brutal this thing is. It's not a stage race. The stage races uh, are when the clock starts and ends at certain times. Uh, on this particular race, the clock starts when they say go and ends when you get to Yorktown. That's it. Uh, other than Other than... Other than that, uh, there's a few checkpoints along the way. Uh, uh, there's a few, uh, you know, alternative routes people have taken, but it's basically a long individual time trial. Um, because it's self-supported, uh, there's a lot of, ex it's an exercise in fitness, of course, uh, an exercise in planning, logistics. Uh, riders have to strategically choose how much they're going to spend on the route, how much they're going to sleep. How much they're, where they're going to eat, uh, you know, what they're going to do about recharging their lights, what they're going to do about recharging their cell phones. Uh, they can stop wherever they want. They can start whenever they want. They can ride 24 hours a day, or they can ride as much as little as they need to. Uh, like an individual time trial, this one drafting isn't allowed. But unlike that, receiving any forms of support from other racers, friends, or family is also not allowed. All the food, all the combinations, repairs, whatever needs to be purchased from commercial sources along the way. Uh, this is critical because the audience, uh, which is commonly called dot watchers, cannot intervene to help even if they see a rider go off track. We had some of that happen earlier this week when one of the riders got lost in Montana and the dot watching community went kind of nuts trying to cheer her on. Uh, to try to get her out of the where she'd gotten lost, and there were there were even people talking about, you know, can we call her? What can we do? And and, and the rules are you don't. You, you need to leave them alone. They they've got a, a tracker. They can push the SOS button. They a lot of them carry almost all of them carry at least one cell phone if not two. They can call for help if they're ready to, if they need to, but in general they're they're supposed to be left to their own devices, and uh, that adds a little bit to the drama and the mystery of the of the race. Uh, and like I said, the, the, everybody can see. There's there, like the audience. The audience participates electronically. They can see on a uh, on a, uh, a, a a website called Track Leaders. The rider physicians in near real time. There's some delay, but you can definitely see the riders. Uh, you can also rewind the race and watch how it unfolded. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, since it's social media, it's not uncommon to have a, a you know a lot of people posting about their favorite writers and what's going on in, uh, on there. And even the writers will sometimes post themselves. There's a few people that are, are posting through Facebook and, and other things there. Uh, it's also an interesting race in the sense that the, the rules are, even though it's called a bike race, the, the rules allow for any type of, of, of bicycle uh, or in human powered vehicles, including recumbent cycles. And uh, it's a lot like street racing in the sense that you run what you brung. Uh, so uh, whatever you show up with, uh, as long as it meets the basic criteria of safety, you're out, you're, you're allowed to run it. Um, on July 2nd, uh, 114 riders left Astoria. Uh, there were 112 standard bikes of various vintages and two velomobiles. And while other recumbents and trikes have participated in, in, in this race, there were just two of the velomobiles. Uh, the two velo, velo knots, as we'd call them, was Marcel from Switzerland and Dave, Dave Lewis from, uh, from Florida. Uh, Marcel is riding a Alpha 7. Uh, that's Dave Lewis in a, in a, in getting, a, getting a friendly nod there on the slide. Uh, the, the Alpha 7 is a new bike made by Daniel Finn. Uh, it's probably the lightest, certainly is the lightest uh, production level Volamobile I know. Uh, the the weigh-in on this one was approximately 35 pounds, and there's going to be some gear in that, so the bike is lighter than that. Uh, I've seen numbers between 30 and 34 for the for the actual shell weight, uh, but I haven't seen either day uh, either Daniel. Uh, or uh, or more so comment on what it actually weighed. I just know the weight in value. Doug, I have to just jump in here for a second to sure. tell everyone. So uh, this shot right here was taken from a short video shot by our uh, by our buddy uh, and fellow panelist who just uh, gave that report about the Warrior Games. It was Larry Seidman. Oh, okay. Who, uh, <laughs> who went from his house mm -hmm. in Colorado Springs. He must have spent four hours on the road at least yesterday tracking these guys down and waiting uh, and for them to come by. So uh, thanks a lot, Larry, for that. Good, good pounce there. Good, it, good it, it was a good adventure for me. It felt like a storm chaser. And in fact, why don't <laughs> we just, if, if, I, if you don't mind, Doug, if I could just take a second sure. and ask, um, ask Larry. So tell me, uh, who, let's leave all the other parts out. So what was it like when you saw, when you saw Marcel go by, what, what did you see and what did you hear and what was it like? It, it was like nothing I'd seen before. Cause I'd been part of uh volunteered with the uh, various pro races and you got spectators and uh state patrol and barricades shutting down the roads this was like nothing like it just everyday normal traffic going on and just a fellow mobile coming down main street frisco exact opposite of a pro bike race yeah all kind of seem low key but it, the stakes are real high so Anyways, thanks a lot for doing that for us, uh, Larry. Appreciate that. Let's go ahead back, uh, Doug. I didn't mean to interrupt. Please no, go no, ahead. No, no, no. It, it really is street racing. I mean, there really is nobody there knowing anything about this other than the people that just know naturally about this race. Okay. So it, it and, and Marcel, I don't know if are you going to get into the guys here. So Marcel, of course, is from uh, Switzerland, right? He's, That's correct. Uh, yeah, and he's, he's training in the Swiss Alps. He's a hell of a good athlete from what I've read before he picked up the Velomobile. Right. Uh, and, he, he, you know, he, he, he's, he's been racing regular bikes for years. And so he's, yeah, he's, he's hand broke glider. Well, yeah. And he's a hand glider instructor. He race, does aerobatic stuff and all sorts of things. He's a really interesting guy to read about. He's, 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 he's certainly the epitome of an ultra athlete. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it's really interesting to, to, if you follow what he's done in the, over the past few years, he's really pushed himself and, and various machines along the way. Right. Uh, and, and the other rider, of course, uh, Dave Lewis is no stranger to our viewers. We had uh, Doug on a couple of videos and a, and a webcast in February. Mm -hmm. uh, you might remember Doug and that Velomobile, his Milan. Oh no, actually, he's a different Velomobile now, right, Doug? Yeah. So he, so he has he when you had, when he was at Sea Ring and uh, and we interviewed him in February. He was on his his DF. Uh, but he recently went to uh, Germany and picked up a custom Milan SL, which was made for him out of the Raider Works group in Germany. And, and it's an interesting story because I was involved in part of that uh, in, in the periphery because he was working on his, he was getting his DF. He'd ordered this, uh, this Milan 
And as, tip, as anybody who's ever gone through the process of buying a Vela mobile will know, uh, it, it's arduous because the, the communication is difficult. The time zones are difficult sometimes, but even the, 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 the way the, 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 the vendors work is that, you know, they got your money uh, or they've got your order and they don't really communicate step by step. They basically give you a couple of it's here, it's this, it's that, it's done, it's shipping. And so Dave was getting anxious that it wasn't going to get ready, uh, wasn't going to be ready on time. Uh, he, uh, uh, he 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 jumped on an airplane when it when they said it was ready, uh, went there, got it, got it dialed in for his his size, um, and then he checked at his baggage on the airplane on the way back. So he literally, there's some pictures out there, wrapped it, in, you know, because he'd asked me how I'd gotten one home, and I told him so that so he had to do it, and he followed, he kind of followed his that way a little ways and did some of his own, but he basically wrapped it in bubble wrap, and stuck it on the plane, and uh, checked it his oversized baggage, got it all the way home, and then he went to, because he's from Florida, he uh, he was concerned about the climbing, and so he got to Florida, spent I think less than a week, and then went to Boulder, Colorado, and spent the remaining time working on his climbs up and down the mountains in Bo- in Colorado. So, uh, Doug, if you could take a second, you know, I don't think you talked. Um, Doug has a special insight into all this because he actually had planned to be in this oh, race. So, yeah. if you just take a minute or so and just um, could you tell the quick story about what your plans were and what happened? Well, yeah. So, I, I had planned to be in this race uh, for, for almost three years now. This was the year I was supposed to be in it. Um, I've been fighting, as, as a lot of the viewers know, I have some health issues and I've been fighting those through, but this was planned up for this. Uh, and then I had, uh, I, I had uh, all intentions of being there, uh, and then I ended up with uh, my uh, mother-in-law passing away, and that cut back some of my riding. And then on the way back from dealing with that, I broke my foot, and so it was just not going to happen this year. Uh, but I am I'm, I'm targeted at it for next year for sure. So uh, it's been a little bit uh, arduous watching these guys, and because I know I wanted to be there, uh, and and you know, and I wish them the best of luck. I know that these guys are doing really hard work. It's a lot of work to train up for this race. It's a lot of work to plan it. I had my, I have my plan um, still, and I've been watching how Dave and Marcel have been doing their rides, and it's very interesting because we haven't shared uh, much. Uh, Dave and I did talk quite a bit about it, but uh, Marcel. I barely know. Uh, and so uh, it's been interesting watching how they've been riding and when they've taken rest and when they've not. And it's very similar to how I would have done it uh, given the climbs. And, and as, yeah. as, as we've talked about before, climbing in a velomobile is difficult. It's hot. It's slow. Uh, you don't get any of the aerodynamics. It's, it's really a big, fat, heavy trike on anything more than about a 2% grade. And they've uh, been through a few more than 2% percent grades here yes, lately they have. Yes, now, they maybe have. at this point if we could could so, uh, let's talk about where our two guys are yeah um, so I, uh, do you want me to bring this up on the screen while you talk about it yeah I sure can, sure if you can let's so, map. You go ahead it's and been talk interesting because as we've had this show things have happened this is a real-time thing so when we started this show uh peter and marcel who are currently the front runners in this uh, were outside of Pebble, Colorado. Uh, they were had just started from Pebble, Pebble Colorado, uh, and they were headed in. And they were headed out toward toward uh, toward uh, Kansas. And since we've been in the show, and, and at the time we started the broadcast, uh, Marcel had just pulled ahead. He was about five seven miles ahead of Peter uh going into kansas and now uh you know and in just the two hours or so the hour well not even two hours that 90 minutes now he's about 30 miles ahead uh, uh marcel is about almost 30 40 miles yeah, yeah almost 40. 40 i mean i haven't you have to hit refresh on this thing every few minutes to see but yeah he's over th- over 30 he's gotten cl- i'm looking at it now he's gotten almost 40 miles ahead he's gaining about three or four miles an hour uh, against the lead, so he. And this is Mar- This is Marcel right here, this is Marcel MG. Marcel right there, and, and then Peter is just behind him. Uh, Peter Anderson. Peter's an amazing athlete of himself too, and so right now the winds are kind of favoring this. There's a south southwest wind at a can- in in the Kansas that's going to favor this a little bit. Although if I was riding, I would pray for a headwind, because the fellow mobile gets most of its advantage when there's a direct headwind. Uh, I, I don't think you'll see that on 
based on the weather forecast. But if it if it was a headwind, then you'd see a much bigger gain going on. But right now, you got a bit of a quartering tailwind. The Velomobile gets a tiny bit of help. The road bike gets a lot of help, but the Velomobile still has his has the other aerodynamic advantages. And so, Marcel's uh, doing 29 miles an hour here. Yeah, at, 29 at the four last minutes minute. ago. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's it's still a slight descent. I've ridden through that area plenty of times. That's about you know an average of one or two percent. Uh, an average of one to a uh, half a percent to one percent grade through that area, uh, as we go as we go all the way through through. Uh, if you look back the course a little bit, Dave Lewis is just coming out of the mountains. Here's so, Dave right here. Right, and he is just now going to start his long descent. I think he's. My guess is he probably stopped. I saw him a few minutes ago at zero. So yeah. he probably is stopping to refuel. Uh, it would be an interesting strategy now to see what he does because. Uh, there's not a whole lot uh, of, of services from where he is to the to a big chunk of the bottom of the hill. Uh, the winds are up, so he may, you know, he whether he decides to stick or ride or, or run down that hill, I don't know. Um, that's and, about where Marcel uh, that's and, where and Peter days. were yesterday about this time, I would that's say. That's right. That's where they were yesterday. Now, Peter left uh, Pueblo uh, at 4 a.m. local time. And uh, he was ahead of Marcel as they started down that hill. But Marcel left at 5 a.m., about an hour later, and caught him uh, th uh, three quarters of the way down that hill. So that's a very big descent. Uh, you drop about 6,000 feet uh, okay. over, the, over the span of about uh, of a span of about 20 miles. Uh, yeah. and Danny, you got something there? Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to comment in on uh, Dave Lewis has started up again, and he's um, – He's about four miles, a little bit less than four miles from the summit of uh, uh, bah, 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 what is that? Who's your uh, who's your who's pass? Your pass? Yeah, who's your pass? So yeah, so yeah. then again, then he's going to yeah. go ahead and run for it, which yeah. I think that's what I would do too. Um, yeah. Given it's one, it's one p one thirty there. Uh, you got lots of daylight left. Uh, the roads are pretty smooth, uh, so I think I would have done that too, uh, and and just fought the wind. And his days Milan is much much better in the wind than almost any other velomobile out there uh it's it's more it's it's the the engineering behind it has a lot more thought in the aerodynamics and certainly for handling crosswinds uh, my own milan is the best velomobile i've got for crosswinds you don't feel them hardly at all even gust won't knock you off track which they, they will in some of the other ones okay doug so, let's uh let's do just a couple of things of note here uh, this is the men's record right here. They oh, always put a, a placeholder, right? So this is what the men's record holder, this is where that record holder was at this time in the race Correct. Uh, right here. So you can see that the two leaders, including Marcel, are uh, a good bit ahead of that pace. And, uh, and, and back to Dave, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop presenting uh, if we could. And uh, I've, I, I got a little information, uh, recent information uh, about uh, Dave uh, from Bill Russell. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Bill is a good friend of Dave Lewis's, and he actually is in touch uh, with uh, Dave. Dave calls him. I guess he doesn't go the other way around because you don't know when Dave might be available to talk to. But here it is. This is my conversation with Bill Russell and what uh, he had to say about uh, what Dave said. Okay, despite Dave's vow to go dark uh, during his race, I've been happily surprised to receive phone calls from him. His stated goal before the race was increase awareness and understanding uh, of performance possibilities on Velomobiles. And I'd say mission accomplished already with that. He is thrilled with Marcel's performance, saying that he is uh, executing perfectly. Uh, it is clear that the Alpha 7, that uh, Velomobile that uh, Marcel is riding, uh, is a purely faster machine. This, combined with Marcel's supremely lightweight and remarkably stoic approach to food and water, is making for a killer performance. As for Dave and his experience, uh, Bill said he that Dave did tell me that at a high altitude, on flat ground, he's able to hold 30 miles an hour at about 150 watts. That is impressive efficiency, uh, Bill says, and even with some struggles, he remains upbeat and excited for the event as a whole. So thank you to Bill Russell for sharing that with us, and we may get some more updates uh, from uh, from Dave through Bill, and we'll share those if we do. All right. Uh, I'd like to interject to, something real quick. Please, if ahead. you don't mind, Gary, put the uh, website in something. 
and so people can track it. It's just a fun thing to track. And also just to let people know, you can really zoom in to the exact street on that course in case you think they're coming by where you might be. It's kind of fun to go watch them come by. Yeah, absolutely. If they stop, you can sometimes see they're at a 7-Eleven or something, or they're at a motel, and that's where they're staying overnight. It is a lot. of Those are the dot watchers. You should become one of them because it's a lot of fun. I, I agree. Uh, and, and Doug, what I was hoping maybe at this point you could do is uh, kind of give us a view of how you see this race playing out from here on as far as our two guys are concerned, especially. So, so you know, uh, that's been a, <laughs> the dot watchers have been speculating a lot on this. Um Having known David, how strong a rider he is, um, I feel like he's probably done, done a lot what I would have done. His bike is heavier than Marcel's. Uh, he has taken some long rest stops. Actually, both the gentlemen have. Uh, I think he's going to start pushing now. Uh, he's in, he was in eighth night. He was in, back and forth between eighth and ninth place earlier. He's in seventh now. Uh, I would guess that on the other side of the uh, of Hoosier Pass, you're going to see Dave really push. And I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't do a long night run either tonight or tomorrow. Uh, the the roads are are, are more are, are and the visibility on the roads are a lot safer that he's going to go through. They're pretty rough, and there's some rumble strips he's going to have to watch out for. But I would guess Dave is going to push a lot harder over the next 24 to 48 hours than he's been. Uh, he certainly has now the advantages that, that his machine will bring him. Uh, I think Marcel is going to gain a lot of ground uh, as well. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how his ride goes. Uh, he certainly, certainly now in his, as well as like Dave, he's in his advantageous ter territory. Uh, it's going to be, uh, those two riders are going to gain their ground now. When they get into the Eastern mountains, things are going to get interesting. I've, like, uh, I've personally ridden all of this route at, out here. Uh, if they can maintain their momentum across the uh, the, uh, the the Andernax and the Ozark mountain areas and some of the further eastern mountains, these guys are going to get well ahead. But if they have issues uh, maintaining their momentum through those, there are some very steep hills. Uh, some of those mountains were 10, 12 percent grades for a couple of miles. Uh, and in a velomobile, you're you know you're pushing a very heavy trike and a very low gear, so you're you're not going to go very fast. You're going to go two, three, four miles an hour at maximum. Uh, even, even somebody who's as fit as these folks are, uh, you just can't, you can't keep away from physics. So you're going to be pairing a lot of weight up those hills. Uh, and it's not going to be that cold. It's going to be hot. It's it, the, the, some of the weather there over the next week is very warm. Uh, not a lot of wind to help you. Uh, so I, and what, I think from what I've read also, Doug, and it seems to make a lot of sense. Uh, I think there, and it's expected that their performance will begin to degrade now as well as they get further into so, this. Is that fair to say? Yeah. So that's an interesting comment. Um, if you follow the so social media, this is, this has been an astonishing thing. Uh, you know, recumbents have entered the Trans Am for, for years. Uh, none of them have done very well uh, on it. And so it's, it's been kind of a, a, a novelty. Uh, this year, these, neither one of these guys were expected to do very well. There's been a lot of comments about how, the, how they, 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 they really astonished the watching crowd of, about their ability to climb through the mountains and to get as far ahead as they are, uh, respectively. Uh, and so the, the dot watching community is got, there's a lot of drama there right now because the, the, the fact that, that a non-traditional bike is way out ahead has, has, has turned, has, has figuratively turned some heads. Uh, but it's caused a lot of speculation on things about how, how, how they will do, uh, based on their history so far in the race and how the performance of these machines will, will drive things. So, uh, I, I, the, I think the general consensus is that they, they will, that they will slow down. Uh, my own personal experience from riding through these areas, I don't think so. Uh, I've done a lot, like said, as said, we said uh, before the broadcast, I've ridden this, and if you can keep your momentum up, you will fly through those mountains. And, okay. and, and so I think this is really going to be a matter of how tired these riders are. Because if they're tired, that's going to be hard to do because you do have, to, even, even with the aerodynamics, you will have to do some climbing. But if you can climb and keep, climb and keep power into the thing as you're coming up the next hill, uh, you you'll manage to get crest the ne crest it with a minimum amount of time loss. And if they can do that, they're going to get way out ahead. If they can't do that, then they're going to fall back like the like the speculation says. All so, right. Well, that all if remains. Made just seen. quickly. Sure, please. Sure. <clears throat> so in the German forums, uh, I can, um, or I will say that uh, the Tino there. Is pretty much the same. Lots of people are um, 
are suspecting that Dave uh, very cleverly um, um, conserved his powers and now will get going once he hits the plains after the Western Mountains. So I agree uh, with Doug that um, those two will be... Well, if the machines um, um, can keep up with, uh, with the power they get from the riders, I'm sure they will be in the lead in the end. Yeah, and I... that's what we're all hoping for anyways. Uh, Lars, thank you for, for that. We, uh, Lars, of course, uh, our Velomobile uh, rider uh, on, our, on our panel as well. And uh, Doug, I think maybe we'll probably leave that there for now uh, with the idea, of course, is that we are all going to be keeping our eye on this. Uh, so yes, more dot watchers. If you are out there, you don't know about this, uh, look in the uh, in the links below. I'm going to have that down there. Start watching. It's an exciting race with a couple of uh, velomobiles to, to cheer on. So let's uh, let's keep that going. And, and, and uh, just keep it, keep it. I got accused of this earlier, and because of some of the language I used, and I think it didn't translate very well on the forum. Uh, and, and, and it's as much as my fault as the person reading it. But all of these people are outstanding athletes. That, that you don't enter this race without training for literally for years and, and doing well on this to do well in this race. Um, and uh, we, as a recumbent community, are, are going to concentrate on the velomobiles. Uh, because it is something that's just an astonishing uh, change in the dynamics of this race. Uh, but nobody should discount any of the other athletes. This is just, these people are incredible humans. They're incredible athletes. And they have all put their, you know, put literally months and months, if not years of work into training up for this race. Yeah, great, I'd, I'd great like, point. I'd like to make one more comment on that. Uh, Peter Anderson, who's in second place on a, on a DF or an upright bike, um, is about three hours or four hours ahead of the men's record uh and uh still still rolling well he's got he's got a good tailwind but still he's he's really really doing very very well yeah, they're, they're actually increasing their distance off the men's record over the last yeah, few hours so. yeah guys yeah. so the, the important thing here i think you have both made a really good point uh our focus of course is on the recumbent so the velomobiles is our focus but we don't want to leave out all of those really uh, um, um, athletes who are, are trying so hard and have given up and sac sacrificed so much, I guess, as Doug is, was talking about, over a number of years to train and to ride. So uh, congratulations to all the riders that are there just for just for being able to do what they've done up to this point. We're going to keep our eyes on those dots, uh, especially the Velomobile dots, though, and uh, keep you guys posted on that. And uh, one last little comment. Ken Kaiser's on the chat. I'm going to be addicted to the racing map. Yes, that does happen. So, uh, Ken, good to see you. Thanks. Uh, so, thanks so much, uh, both um, uh, Denny and, and Larry, and especially Doug, for that uh, great report. And uh, we'll, we'll be checking back. So, all right, folks, uh, I think it's time maybe to talk about our sponsors one more time today. Uh, first of all, thanks so much to TerraCycle. Check out their unique bags and purple sky flags and trailside.bike, where you'll get free shipping on all orders over $50 until July 1st, 2018. And Velocity, the builders of performance wheels and rims, handmade in the USA. Thanks to our sponsors uh, once again. All right, folks, I just wanted to remind you of a couple things here. Uh, first of all, uh, I've mentioned in the show a couple of times, really important information for you to know about. In the description below the, the uh, video that you are watching right now will be a table of contents uh, so that you can jump to any particular portion uh, of the show that we have, uh, that we have uh, just produced. So you can um, watch it in parts if you wish, because they do kind of run long. And as I've mentioned a few times in the show, uh, every link uh, that we have referenced throughout the show will also be down in uh, that description so that you can uh, jump right to the web, the appropriate website, uh, whether it uh, be the Trans Am race uh, map, or, uh, or anything from, uh, from Paul Elkins, his website and his, uh, his YouTube channel, all those things are gonna be right down there. So uh, give me a few hours after the show here today, I'll have that all in there for you to look at. 
Uh, so yeah, please make sure that you check that stuff out. And let me tell you about what's coming up uh, on the next laid back bike report. Uh, it's gonna be June 8th, and we are gonna start talking more specifically about uh, human powered vehicle racing. Uh, this is a different kind of race than the Trans Am and Race Across America. It's what uh, Alan Goodman talked about at the top of the show. Uh, the human powered, uh, the world human powered vehicle uh, 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 championship and in England. And yes, we are going to be there. Uh, and to tell us a little bit about the race and what's going on in hu human powered racing around the world, we have a couple of experts uh, coming on our webcast next month before we go to England. Mike Mowat uh, and Arnold Lickvogt uh, will be on to talk about uh, their experience in human powered racing. They both have considerable experience about this. And uh, we'll have your questions available for them to answer. And uh, we'll find out all about what it takes to uh, be a human powered vehicle pilot. All right, uh, let's see what else is going on here. Oh, I, I, you know, one thing we didn't really mention, uh, we did tell you that we're going to, uh, to England to cover the races. And we are gonna be sponsored by ice trikes, the same ice trikes that Peter told you about. Uh, we are uh, excited to have them as our major sponsor. Uh, and they are also sponsoring, um, I don't think Alan mentioned it, but they are also sponsoring the actual race. They're gonna have lots of, uh, uh, lots of activity there. I think things for you to do. Let's see, what did we see? Alan mentioned earlier uh, on, a, on a chat message here. Um, they will be there in force. They have about a dozen riders entered. Uh, in the races and are providing free workshop facilities uh, for all riders. So uh, thank you to ICE uh, for all that stuff. They do a great job uh, on all that. So we look forward to uh, seeing you guys next month on the webcast and then uh, our trip to England. A quick shout out. We mentioned also earlier, uh, Paul did, about Randy riding. So yes, Randy, who was on the show a few months ago talking about his quad yak, the amphibious quad. Uh, he has begun his very ambitious uh, uh, cross uh, Trans Am himself, I guess, um, but it's an amphibious Trans Am. So, yeah, he is going to be taking some roads, but I think 75% uh, of his uh, journey across the country will be on the rivers uh, or other bodies of water to, to get where he's going. So he there you see him uh, dipping his wheels into the Pacific and uh, he's on his way. I think he's kind of holed up for a day or so because of some bad weather, but he will be taking the rest of the summer, I think, to uh, get across there. So uh, keep uh, keep an eye out on our uh, our Facebook page and uh, we'll, we'll try to keep you updated. Maybe we'll even be able to have him on later in the uh, next month or so and Get maybe a live update from him, but we wish him all the best, Randy. Uh, uh, <laughs> this is really an epic uh, performance for the word epic. Uh, you you have reached the uh, epitome, I think. So uh, that's Randy riding. So okay, um, a couple of thanks uh, to finish the show up. Uh, uh, Brian Ball, uh, Bent Rider, always uh, helpful for uh, uh, promoting our cause. We thank you, Brian, for that. Um, Please uh, um, watch our uh, YouTube channel um, for our, our new videos. If you subscribe, uh, you'll and, and click the little bell in the subscription, um, you'll get a notification whenever we have a new video. So that'll make it easier to know when we do put something up. Uh, so please subscribe uh, again. That little red, uh, that little red uh, subscribe uh, word down there that will get you to that spot. You can like us on the uh, Laidback Bike Report uh, Facebook page. That would help us out. Check out our website, uh, laidbackbikereport.com. Uh, you can get there by either typing that in or hitting that uh, little uh, white eye. We'll get you to the Laidback Bike Report website as well. And uh, while you're there, you can uh, uh, do a number of things. You can check out our, all of our sponsors at the top of the page. We hope you'll support them. You'll be able to find our most recent show, our upcoming shows, our past shows. We have some bonus materials, pictures and such that we don't uh, get onto uh, the website or the, or I'm sorry, onto the Facebook page or, or maybe during a show. Bonus material there. And you can sign up for our mailing list where I will send you an email once or twice a month, uh, bringing you up to date on what's new with the Laid Back Bot Report. And you can buy a hat. The only appearance by Larry Varney today, unfortunately, is this one. But we really appreciate Larry's support. And uh, yeah, if you want to buy a hat, 20 bucks, 
uh, on the website, $5 shipping and handling, handling, we would appreciate that. So you can find all that stuff uh, right at uh, www, that was four, www.laidbackbikereport.com. So thanks so much, all of you, for uh, for bearing with us today uh, with our little technical difficulties. Thanks for watching the show. We hope you enjoyed it. And from all of us here at the Laidback Bike Report, so long, Bent Riders.